Hi, everyone. So I'm joined here today with my great friend, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. How are you? Good. How are you? My sister from the islands. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Tell us, where are you again today? I'm in the Washington, D.C. area in, in Northern Virginia. Yeah, exactly. No, I haven't, I haven't been to Washington, D.C. yet, sadly, but I'm definitely planning to come and visit Lauren. So I'll let you know when, I, when I'm in town. So Lauren and I have known each other for a little while. We've crossed paths in different training sessions. We did a session with Kelby Bird a while back before COVID and follow each other avidly on LinkedIn and Instagram. And we have a very shared passion. We come from the same, the same wheelhouse of facilitation and training and consulting. She's an amazing visual facilitator, graphic facilitator. I've seen Lauren's work and can only aspire to be as, as good as you are, Lauren. You're so great. Like, just anyway, I can go on about that for a long time, but I won't. But we come to, we have these shared passions in life. And one of our shared passions is meetings. And that's what's brought us here today to kind of chat. But before we dive into meetings, Lauren, do you want to share a little bit about yourself and what you love about your work? I just want to share how special it was when I met you. And of course, in true Zoom fashion, I just got it. <laughs> your internet is unstable notification, <laughs> but let me know if it, if it You're causes all good. any any issues. But when I met Trisha and we, we actually sat down to chat, it was the first time I realized how incredible it is when you hear something that you're passionate about being married back from someone else. And I learned so much from you in that talk and the things that you're interested in and who you're following out there. And that has inspired me ever since. So, and of course, love following you on Instagram and everything that you're putting out in, in the world. So I'm so excited that we're taking this time to do a shared collaboration and, and put our, our shared passion out into, into the world. <laughs> Absolutely. And one of our shared passions is you and I are both so, you know, our heart lives in the space around meetings and, you know, people say meetings, oh goodness, like why, why are you so passionate about meetings? But I think our passion is about, we want to make yeah. meetings great in the world. Yeah. So many meetings are just crap and people hate them. And you have a wonderful podcast called Why Meetings Suck. And everybody needs to know why meetings suck and how, what to do about it. And we'll share links to podcasts and that kind of stuff afterwards as well. But we have this passion about changing meetings. <laughs> exactly. This meeting sucks. Exactly. <laughs> we have this passion to change meetings, to make meetings, you know, powerful moments in your day, you know, instead of moments that you dread in your day, moments that you could look forward to in your day, because they are enlightening, they are engaging, they are exciting, they bring out the best in everyone. And I think that's, we have many shared passions, but that is definitely one of them. So tell me a bit about your thoughts about meetings and why, why you have this passion as well. Like what comes up for you? Thank you so much for the question and get ready because I'm going to throw it back at you. <laughs> so people often ask me, they think that the podcast, when I, when I say this meeting sucks, they think that I'm going to tell them that their meeting should have been an email because that's the tagline. This could have been an email. And I don't adhere to that. I adhere to if there's a meeting on your calendar, it's there for a reason. And, you know, are there instances when we, and, and when, okay, so backing up, I should clarify what I mean by meeting a presentation, a one-way delivery of information. Sure. That can come in an email or that can come in a video or some other form that can be one way, but a meeting being, we have to collaborate on something. We need to give each other feedback. We're looking for a dialogue that does need to happen. And yet we don't have trainings and competencies that are in our workforce naturally to develop that. And I recently was looking through Instagram. I found an account. I won't tell you which one it is. They put out facilitation training into the universe and on their ads, they have these ads. And if you go through their ads, you can see comments of people who say facilitation is not a real thing. Just a lot of hecklers. I, and, and, but also a lot of like, oh, I already do facilitation skills, but I didn't know this was a thing. And both of those things are interesting. And I agree with both. Number one, that the world shouldn't need facilitators, but as long as meeting sucks, we will. <laughs> 
everybody should be a facilitator. Mm -hmm. And number two, absolutely, people are already doing facilitation skills without realizing it, and that needs to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just, that was something that came up recently, and I wanted to share it with you, and yeah. I feel for that for yeah. what they're putting out into the world. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw it back at you. What, what drives you to come into this mission of unsucking meetings, of bringing meeting skills to the broader audience? So I'll, I'll summarize that. I'll try and summarize that in sort of two main things. I think that drive it for me. One is like you were alluding to most of the time, we have no idea what a good meeting looks like. We have been, most of us who live in an organizational world, who run a business, you know, at work, work in any kind of way have been part of a meeting. And, you know, we've seen meetings done well, and maybe we've seen them done not so well, but we really have no idea. There is very little meeting competency skills that are out there. And we don't learn that in school. You know, we don't learn it at university. Yet it is even a part of how we work together in projects and stuff like that in schools and at university. We come together in small groups to work on something, which is having a meeting. But nobody knows how to, how to lead a great meeting. So if you're lucky in your life, you've seen some good mentors and they've done some good things and you kind of inherited and taken that with you. But for most of us, we think what we've seen is how you lead a meeting, but we really don't know what good looks like. You know, mm -hmm. I've had people say to me, I've run meetings for 17 years. I thought I knew everything about it. But when I learned all these things, my mind was just blown because I really had no idea about this is what it takes to run a good meeting. And as you were alluding to, a lot of the tips that we share around good meetings come from our background and our work as facilitators. We take those things that we know as facilitators that help create the right experience or get people to engage, get people to collaborate, get people to connect and work together. And we bring them into the meeting. And then all of a sudden it feels totally different to what it was. So that's the first one for me. Why, why is it so important to me? Is one, because most of us just don't know it. And, you know, there's a whole, we all need to know it, but most of us don't. That's one. And then the other thing that's so important to me around this is I, I truly believe that meetings are a touch point in our day that can become tipping points for cultural change. They, can, they are the moments that basically shape culture in our organizations and our teams, because they are when we come together as a group. So that's when we get the stories of this happened or that happened. And this is what, you know, we get the organizational stories that become the foundation that we tell other people about this culture. So most of the time, if you hear people talk about culture, they'll be like, oh, in this culture, you're not allowed to speak up if something goes wrong. And they'll tell you a story of what happened in a meeting where someone did that. Right. So those cultural stories are coming from those moments. A lot of them are not all, obviously, but many of them are coming from when we meet. And we're so, in essence, flippant and careless about how we meet. So we don't even realize the impact of the moment that we have in front of us to shape culture. And then we wonder why we need a culture change program. <laughs> right. I'm like, well, I actually don't need a culture change yeah. program. You need to think about your meetings. And if you, you think about the meetings that you have. It's going to start to impact your culture. <laughs> so that's what's and, really important for me. And and I'll add one one more to that, which is the 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 either achieving your ROI or achieving the mission. Yeah. It all starts with how we meet. So if you are trying to make the case for better meetings to leadership, having better meetings does result in higher productivity, teams working better together, and ultimately higher performance. And that's what we all want at the end of the day. And I think you know. I see this over and over again. We both work with leaders, leaders of today of organizations who need to innovate, want to get the most from their participants and don't know how to do it yeah. and often are too afraid to ask. And it's really sad, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, so, so this is kind of a call, not only to the professionals, the project managers, the team leads, the agile scrum masters, but this is a call also to senior leaders yeah. and directors to say, you can run a better meeting. How the way that you lead tomorrow is through facilitation. If you want the most out of your people. Absolutely. So anybody who wants to achieve certain results, you know, has a, a plan ahead of them, results of what they're thinking about performance levels, and they're thinking about, you know, the culture and how we work together. 
think about your meetings because that is that is the catalyst to those two things right like you're saying to the performance and the culture your meetings are the catalyst to achieving that I think that's why we're just so passionate crazy passionate <laughs> about I, this I totally agree I, I want to throw a question at you and maybe this is something that participants wherever you're watching YouTube Facebook wherever you can put some ideas in the comments and what when people come to you and they they gripe about their meetings what's the most common thing that you're hearing yeah so i hear a lot the gripe comes a lot about the amount of tangents that we go off in a meeting mm. that you know we get into a meeting and we think we're here for one thing and then you just have certain people or dominant personalities and they take us off in tangents and we just feel like we never get anything done so circular conversations and tangents are two really big things that I hear a lot and people don't know what to do about them. What about you? I, I would have to agree with that. And, you know, no clear agenda. Don't know why we're here. And the thing about those things, whether it's going down rabbit holes or not having a clear agenda or not knowing why we're here, they're actually incredibly simple to change yeah. with just a couple of, of actions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I I totally agree. So, kind of in that realm, I told you I was going to share this before we yeah. we on the call, but I'm teaching a, a workshop tomorrow, and I pulled the group ahead of time. Now, granted, this is from five respondents, so like, don't think of this as anything scientific. But I asked them, "What would you like to learn the most in this workshop?" Because I only have four hours, <laughs> and what I'm hearing the most is decision making tools. Wow. To your point about tangents. And, and also navigating conflict that, and, and so that kind of can also go on with tangents. A lot of times we perceive tangents are going down rabbit holes or kind of going back and forth. We perceive it as conflict. And so understanding how to navigate that for yourself and navigate with that with a group is really, is really big. Not interestingly, the, the, actually the basic facilitation skills, which I think are probably the most relevant to people kind of were down there at the bottom. I'm not really sure why, but it's interesting to see, you know, what, do, what do people want? Any reactions? Yeah, no, definitely. Very, very interesting to look at it and kind of my synapses are going off. I'm thinking about all sorts of different things. I mean, one of the things I'm thinking of, you're saying, you know, it's kind of interesting that number seven or seventh was the basic facilitation skills, right? But I think some of the basic facilitation skills help with the decision making and the conflict as well. So it's just making the connection between how those th things serve the pain point, you know, it might be really interesting for people as well, right? Because we may not just make the connection between the skill or the practice or the thing that we do and how that actually helps to deal with the pain point. Because just like you were alluding to, they're simple things. They're often really simple things that we do. So either a, a tool that you might introduce or a practice that you might, a practice or a ritual that you might introduce into your meeting that starts to deal with some of those pain points, but you don't necessarily make the direct connection between those two things. Does that resonate with you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I'm wondering, you know, there's so many different little things that you can do to help meetings run better. I'm wondering if you want to share just a couple of nuggets related to how people can address tangents or rabbit holes in their group. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll answer that question from a slightly different perspective. I'm not sure if I can, maybe I can bring it up. I'll just um, bring it up as well. What I'll share with you is kind of this model that I, a model that I created to help people understand exactly how this, essentially how you can start thinking about making changes in your meetings and kind of starting from the very bottom and kind of working its way up. So I'll just share that maybe. Let me see if I can do it quite as quickly as you are. I didn't have my screen all set up for that. So let me just, oh, here we go. This is an authentic Zoom, people. Yes, We're exactly. doing this. It's very organic. Exactly. <laughs> two it's minutes of planning organic. ahead of time so we're just here to jam <laughs> exactly exactly okay i'll do a portion of the screen so that it's kind of helpful here so we just get nice. in the right place oh i love this yes so you know quick things that people can do i mean for me it starts this is about moving meetings like you said from like or like we've said for meetings that just happen so being part of you know they just happen we don't really think much about them if they're good, great. If they're not, everybody's frustrated, burnout, and really just miserable. 
to meetings that do exactly like you were saying, they drive new levels of performance and they shape the culture that we want to have. So how do we move from meetings that just happen to meetings that do that? How can you get started? Which is what you're saying, you know, like they're quick and easy things that people can do, but how do you kind of start, start moving from one to the other? So for me, this is a ladder. And I think about the very first part of it is thinking about purpose yeah. and thinking about purpose, whether that be, it's a little bit more than maybe just your purpose statement, but what type of meeting are you having? What is your purpose statement and how that feeds into who needs to be there? And do you really need a meeting? All those types of questions that you were saying, you know, so really honing in and getting and focusing on purpose gets you to this point where you have meetings with clarity, right? So there's some simple tools and things that you can do. But when you focus on purpose, you get to that point of meetings that have clarity. People know why they're there to have that meeting, basically. The next thing I start to think about is, well, knowing what I know about that meeting and the purpose, which are the most appropriate tools? Because it's not every tool for every meeting. I mean, you've alluded to this as well, right? We don't want the, all the same tools, whether you're in your daily stand-up or if you're in your weekly leadership team meeting. There might be very different tools that you want to have in there. So what are the tools that you need? And when you get clarity on which tools that you need in that meeting, you get to meetings that function. They just function well because they do what you're there to do. You have the tools to support it. And then I won't go all the way up, but I'll, maybe I'll just touch on the next one. But the next thing I start to think about is practices or rituals. So what do we do as part of the, that meeting? Some of the practices or the rituals. And when we focus on that, then we start to get to meetings that really involve everyone. So we put in, started to put in place practices and rituals of things like checking in and checking out or how we make decisions. We get clarity on that and we get to a point that really involves people. So you get to meetings that involve. And I'll kind of stop there because this isn't about going off about this model, but I just wanted to talk about when you ask me, like, what do I do? Those are some of the first things that I start to think about. You know, how do we get clarity around purpose? Then what are the most appropriate tools? And then what are the most appropriate practices that will get us to the point of involving others? And that just gets us to a point, I think, where meetings work really well. <laughs> you know, it kind of we, they work really well. They're effective and they engage people. You know, so we're getting value out of them, real value out of them. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I love it. And I am i can't wait to promote the heck out of this model. It's <laughs> so brilliant. Um, of course, being a visual facilitator, I'm all about a good metaphor. So I love the ladder behind it. Yeah. And I agree. It all starts with purpose. So what are you doing in the beginning of the meeting? Why are we here? It doesn't matter if you're doing a two and a half day offsite or a one hour weekly tag up. Exactly. It always starts with why are we here? We're here today because X, it can be a second. Mm -hmm. I really love the model ors from the Grove, yeah. which is outcomes, agenda, rules, and roles. I'll say it again. Outcomes, agenda, rules, and roles. The four things you should start any meeting with. Yep. Talk about outcomes, the agenda. Again, even if it's in a weekly meeting today, we're going to hear from everybody. And then we're going to summarize next steps. Yeah. It doesn't have to be crazy. Here are our agreements. If you don't have many agreements, come up with some. Yeah. We're exactly. going to listen actively. We're going to have our cameras on. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> always triggering me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then roles, you know, who's leading the meeting and, and who's participating and clarifying that if it's, if it's not clear. That's such a super great tip for anyone that leads a meeting, just in terms of kicking off in those first five minutes, you know, that always model by the group. I love it as well. And I love that you brought that up. I want to, I'm going to throw you a question maybe from a slightly different frame, because one of the things I often get asked as well is we're talking, or we started this conversation, maybe exploring this from the perspective of people that lead meetings and yeah. what can they do and why it's so important for them to lead meetings well and the impact and all the benefits of that. We're touching on all of that. But sometimes I get asked the question about, well, I don't actually own the meeting. I don't own the meeting and I don't lead the meeting but I suffer the consequences of the poor meeting, right? And I'm not in a position to maybe make an intervention with the meeting leader, whether that's, I don't feel confident to give them feedback or something like that. So how can I, the question I get asked is how can I, as a meeting participant, help to influence meetings to be great when I don't own them? Right. So yeah. what are some of the things that I can do? So we, we've already started talking about things that leaders can think yeah. about. But what are some of the things that meeting participants can do to help a meeting be more effective, to, to just be better when it is that they don't have a position of power or decision making about that meeting? 
Is that something you've been asked as well? I have been asked it too. Actually, it came up daily in the work in the <laughs> academy that I taught this summer. And so we're going to keep this going back and forth yeah. because I have some ideas and I knew you do as well. So this is kind of the, the juicy meat of this video. Don't log off yet, everybody. <laughs> Good stuff is coming. So I'm going to throw out the first one, which I think is mindset. We go into meetings and we have our own individual agenda. The first thing that you can do to be a good meeting participant is to, of course, have your agenda and the things that you need to get out of it, but also to expand your awareness to the needs of the group. That's the first thing is to recognize that whoever is leading the meeting and every single other person in the meeting has an agenda just like you do. And there are ways for you to make the meeting better by allowing everybody else to have equal space Mm -hmm. and you can be a part of how that becomes better. So I'm going to say the first one is mindset, changing that from individual perspective to a collective, which we're not always great about, especially in the U S I don't think we're we're not great about it here either in the Caribbean. (laughs) So maybe it's universal. We can't say, but maybe, um, (laughs) I'm going to add to that as well, because the, I love that point about mindset and sort of showing up with the right mindset, I think is, you know, that, that first point that you brought up, which I think is, is right. What that it makes me think about as well, in terms of mindset, and I guess maybe it's connected to to mindset is, is presence. Because I think if you have the right mindset and you're like, I have an agenda, I know that I have reasons to be here and this is what I want to get out of it but re- but remembering that so does everybody else and so what does that mean for how I show up but that leads me to presence because if you're present and you're focused and you are giving attention to other people when they're sharing their issues so you're not just checking out and because you have that mindset that everybody here has something that they want to get out of this as well so I think presence is something for me because I see this so much in meetings like people show up they're like well, I don't know why I'm here or that person again talking about their thing. And so what do they do? They just tune out. They pick up their phone. They turn off their video, right? They they just tune out. And that takes your meeting, I think, down a really slippery slope. So for me as a meeting participant, one of the things that you can do is actually, like you said, turn on your camera. And you know what? Turn over your phone. Just be present. Just be present for the time that you're here. You know, I think that makes, if everybody were just present in a meeting, Mm -hmm. fully present, giving each other undivided attention, not sharing it with their phone or the notifications on their computer or whatever else. I think that alone changes the effectiveness of a meeting because we're all there together. So that's what you make me think of. When you think, talk about mindset, I start to think about helps me be, be present, just be in the room with everyone. I think dominant personalities, like you said, or people hogging the airtime is a huge problem with meetings. And so to kind of build on, we've talked about mindset and presence to build on that is recognizing that we all have to be a little bit braver in meetings to hold each other accountable Mm -hmm. and recognize that if you're seeing somebody dominate the conversation, you have to be, I, I love the term radical candor, that the book radical candor, you have to be direct and kind. And you, you know, people don't want to speak up and hold that person accountable and say, Hey, can we hear some, from somebody else? Or, you know, we haven't heard from so-and-so do you have any thoughts? Making space requires being brave, but it also doesn't have to mean you, you're, you need to be mean or rude or, or a jerk to the guy who's dominating. They're probably not aware. So being brave and from that standpoint, assuming noble intent, and then what I what I actually just said there, making space, that is actually a technique, a facilitation technique yeah. from Sam Kaner's A Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making. I know it's such a mouthful, <laughs> that book, but it's such an amazing book. Yeah. yeah. Making space for others, making space for others. And it can simply be, Trisha, we haven't heard from you in a while. Would you like to say something? Or I love to hear what Charles has to say. Mm-hmm. it's as simple as that. And anybody can do it. Try it. Let us yeah. know how it goes. <laughs> Absolutely. And so what you're making me think of as well is there's an element of this that's self-awareness, self-awareness and group awareness, right? To being a good meeting participant. It's like, what am I noticing in the group? And can I, can I make space for someone else, for example, or, or can I make an intervention that, you know, like you said, is a bit of radical candor, like, Hey, Lauren, I love what all of what you've been sharing. Can we, can we also hear from Trisha? 
for example, or, you know, or can we invite Tusha to share her thoughts as well? So there's the sort of being aware of what's happening into the group, just sort of being observant, almost like stepping back and just taking a moment, looking at it, and then maybe making a intervention that has a bit of radical candor in it. And the self-awareness side that you're making me think of is also how am I playing into the group? So like, am I taking up all the room? Do I need to step back and maybe just be quiet for a bit? Am I always the first person to speak? Maybe today I'll just be quiet for a bit longer, for example. Or am I, do I never speak in this meeting? Maybe today I'll have a bit of courage and I'll share. I'll share something as well. Exactly. So being self-reflective on my own behaviors and how I tend to show up in a meeting and just thinking about how is that serving the group? You know, am I holding back my own opinions and perspectives because there's always someone else that's speaking or am I always that person that's speaking? You know, so just being self-aware as well as what you're bringing yeah. up for me and something else. What I else comes that. up for you? Oh my gosh, so many things. I know. <laughs> so we just... Um, <laughs> So we talked about modeling the behavior. That's what it is. And a lot of people don't want to do it because they have this attitude like, well, why should I be the one to model this when nobody else is going to do it? Nobody's going to mm. appreciate me for doing this. Nobody's going to recognize that I'm doing this. And to that, I say, try to put that aside and stick with it. Yeah. Because if you model these behaviors consistently over time, they will become, other people will pick up on it and start to do it. And I want to hear that story. So if that happens to you, I want to hear that story. So first model it. And then the one I'm going to say kind of to your point about if you're the person that speaks a lot, try to sit back a little bit. If you're the person that sits back, try to lean in a little bit is asking questions. <laughs> So the, the great book, A More Beautiful Question, another great book, The Coaching Habit, in both the authors talk about, I think it's Warren Berger and Michael Stanier. They both talk about how we are programmed to advocate. And here's the advocacy inquiry model. I need to look, mm -hmm, need to look that one up again. We, we're programmed to advocate. We're programmed to have answers. When you start to train your brain to ask questions, it doesn't feel right at all all, but it's like the number one, most important thing that you could start doing. And if you want to practice asking questions, try it for an entire meeting or even just half. Don't say anything about your own opinion. Just ask a question. I'm wondering, like, I see you nodding. So oh, I want to, so like, yeah, tell me more about like, I, I don't know if you want to talk about questions, but I'd love to hear your tips on asking questions because this is something I'm very passionate about. Because I love what you've been going on. I want to, before I talk about the question, that you made me think about something when you were like the modeling of the behavior and just keep being consistent. Uh, and you know what else you can do? Phone a friend, bring a friend, you know, yes. enlist someone else who is like just a colleague in the meeting that says, hey, let's try like just being fully present. We won't bring our phones and see what happens. See if anybody else notices, you know, like just enlist some support in something simple to role model the behavior. You don't have to take it on by yourself, right? You know, you can bring a friend and makes it all the more fun. Let's 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 see if anyone observes what we're doing, you know, that we're doing something different. Like even the questions one, let's see today if both you and I are only going to ask questions in this meeting. Let's see if anyone notices, for example, that we're doing something different, right? You can spice it up with your own creativity, sort of bring a friend bit. I love that you were talking about that inquiry advocacy model. I know it as inqu inquiry, acknowledgement and advocacy. Where I came to it from, I believe it was a, a model from uh, the negotiation project with Harvard Business Re Review. That's where I learned about it, but I'm not sure if that's the actual origins of it. I can't remember who actually came up with the model, but it was part of something that I learned in, in that space. And it's so much like, like you're saying, we, we start often with advocacy, our stating our point of view, instead of starting with inquiry, right? So starting with asking questions, then even acknowledging, sometimes we don't even acknowledge what other people have said. So like we heard other people say, I, Lauren, I've been hearing you talk so much about this. It's so much, this is obviously a really important issue to you, you know, what's critical for you that we have to get right. For example, you know, just acknowledging what you heard. So the inquiry, there's inquiry, then there's advocacy. I mean, inquiry, acknowledgement, and then advocacy, which is stating our point of view. And we can, if we just practice shifts to either inquiry or acknowledgement, it's such a big difference in a meeting rather than everybody just advocating or stating their point of view. So I just love that you brought that model up and you were talking about 
those simple questions that you can ask simple ones yeah and we talked in the beginning about like one of the big things we see is tangents here's a simple question when you see a tangent are we still on track guys (laughs) you know I'm noticing that we've been talking about this for a while are we still on track for why we're here today it's as simple as that it doesn't have to be you know confrontational it doesn't have to be I think we've lost the plot you know with advocacy just ask the question are we still on track you know so it brings those things up for me just simple little questions like that I'm noticing this and how can you turn that into a question for example and Kaner talks about those skills too so we've actually given you three skills that you didn't know that you already had in your toolkit so going to the balcony um, he doesn't use those those terms but going to the balcony and saying I'm noticing Mm -hmm. that is going to the balcony in the room looking down on the room and observing what's happening it's also part of how you help your team learn about itself so that's going to the balcony and then paraphrasing or you said acknowledging acknowledge this is what I'm hearing in the group and then asking a question um, are we still on track did I get that right what do others think it's all of those, a question that you can get out in 10 words or less is probably all that you need. And just don't be afraid to ask the dumb question. We all have an ego, but if you're the one, so my mom's a facilitator. I don't know if I told you that, but she always says that one of the things that she is never afraid to do is be the dumbest person in the room. Just put that ego aside, because if you're willing to ask the question that's coming up to you, and be okay with that vulnerability. And that's what it kind of comes down to is we're not willing to be vulnerable and ask yeah. that question. But if you're okay with it, then you, other other people will start to be too. Yeah. And yeah. they will probably appreciate you because they had that same question. <laughs> Absolutely. I always phrase it. I love it the way, you know, your mom, I actually knew that from listening to your podcast about your mom being a facilitator. <laughs> you know, that kind of dumbest question in the room. Yeah. Or another way of just thinking about that, if it, you know, if it rubs your ego in the wrong way for some reason, but I always think about it like, hey, can I, can you guys help me? Can you help me understand why we're doing this is another way of sort of just thinking about that. Like I, can you help me understand what we're doing here? Or can you help me understand what are we trying to get out of this? You know, so just being able to put that people are always willing to help you because, you know, I think people want to feel like they're adding value as well. So, you know, if you phrase it in a way, it's like, can you help me? Then people are, are very likely to respond to that as well, rather than just saying, no, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> so I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of phrasing it in that way is another great way to just kind of be the person who's willing to ask the courageous question. But like you said, that no doubt everybody else is thinking, but phrasing it in a way of like, can you help me understand what we're doing here? Or can you help me understand how this is helping us to achieve what we're doing or our purpose or, or this thing, right? So phrasing it like that is something that you're making me think of as well. It reminds me so much. So Edgar Schein um, wrote a book called Helping. And in that book, he talks about how um, we don't like to ask for help because that's vulnerable. And it it puts us one down on the power dynamic. Hmm. But it's what we have to do in order to, you have to be willing to ask for help. You have to be willing to be the one to model. And so that bravery, that willing to be vulnerable, yeah. holla to Brené Brown and all of the work that she's done, it's it's all connected. I've got, I've got a couple more and I imagine that you do also. Yeah. The one that I'm going to go to next is be the note taker. And mm-hmm. as a graphic recorder, and I know you are as well, I always like to say he who holds the marker or she or they who hold <laughs> the marker holds the power. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Holds the power, the power of the pen. <laughs> it's the power of the pen. And so whether you're the one taking notes on a, in a document or on a flip chart, number one, if you're bored, it gives you something to do. But (laughs) if you, and not just notes, but notes that people can see, they have to be able to see it. If people can see what they are talking about on the screen, on the board, it will help with your tangents and it'll make you feel good because you're active. People see what they said, they're less likely to repeat themselves and the meeting is more likely to flow better. So don't take notes behind the scene, take notes where everyone can see them. 100%. And I'll just build on that because that's one role that you can play, but I think, you know, be the note taker, but play a role. You could play a role. So you could just play a role in a meeting. So note taker is one, but timekeeper could be another. If you have a meeting that always goes 
on for hours and hours and is, you know, and always runs over time. Say today, hey, I would like, to, I'd like to volunteer today to be a timekeeper. I'm going to let us know when we're 20 minutes in, 10 minutes to go so that we finish on time. Because I know we're all busy and we all want to make sure that we finish on time, for example. So you can just volunteer to play a role, right? You can play a role with note, note taking. You can play a role with timekeeping. I think those are, you know, playing a role is another great way to get involved and help your meeting. The other one that I was thinking of when you were chatting is just, and I think we kind of alluded to this in many ways, but just kind of lean in, get engaged. You know, so many times I see people in a meeting and, you know, and, and their, their kind of preferred position is like this, <laughs> right? Or you like know, this. They, yeah. Like, well, I'll even take that one. I think at least that one, maybe they're kind of getting in there, but like this one <laughs> is really, really is like, oh no. I mean, they're like physically leaning out. Like I'm here to be entertained. Entertain, entertain me, show me your presentation, entertain me. And they physically are even like leaning out. They just like checked out, you know, at least I'm like, at least leaning in, we might, we might be getting, might have a little bit of attention in there, but getting engaged, I think is one for me, you know, and I think that connects to the being present and the mindset that you were talking about and all those other things, but just get engaged is one for me as well. And I think, you know, getting engaged, like, realizing that even if you're not the one running the meeting, that um, you can be kind of a silent helper to the facilitator or team lead. And one of the ways to do that is by recognizing what it is that they're trying to do. Yeah. And, and so I want to just maybe quickly draw, I think we have a few more minutes. Yeah. Right. Again. Okay. So I want to draw out a model that I know you're well familiar with and and maybe maybe some others are as well, um, which is the the Kaner diverge converge model. And yep. so in a meeting, we have diverging conversations. And this can be thought of like opening the faucet where we have all of the ideas coming out. And then we also have converging or closing the process where we're trying to land on that, those are light bulbs, um, on that mm -hmm. one final decision. And then there's everything that happens in between, which Kaner calls the grown zone. I prefer the word refine, where we have to build understanding around those ideas. And so recognizing that at any one point of the meeting, the team lead is trying to do one of these three things. And you can help. If you sense that the group is in open, then you can ask more open-ended questions like, what does so-and-so think? If you sense the group is in close, you can ask closed-ended questions like, have we heard all of the ideas? That's a yes or no question. Are there any objections to that? Mm -hmm. That's a yes or no question. Or just if you recognize the group is in close, don't be that person that goes, but we haven't thought about such and such, you know, <laughs> save it because we're trying to come to closure. I know it, this is a model that almost everyone tees up, but what, what else would you say is a way to use this or, or anything else that's coming up for you? Well, I love that you brought this model up because I think the first thing that comes up for me is just recognize that you don't just go from open to close. You don't just go from divergent straight to you know, convergence on an idea that you do have to go through that messy middle bit, that refined bit in the middle. And that can be tough for people. And I think that's a great space. So knowing how, like you were saying, knowing where you are in the meeting, so recognizing what the meeting leader is trying to do. Are we in open or are we in refine or are we in close? And then playing the helpful, being the helpful participant at any one of those spaces means doing something different. So like you were saying, if you recognize that we are in open, then this is where we want you to share perspectives, share ideas. So we want you to contribute. We want you to draw out from other people, ask questions like, have we heard from so-and-so? What are your thoughts, et cetera? If we're in refine, it's a different type of question. It's like, well, what connections are we seeing here? What commonalities are we seeing? Like, you know, are there points that, you know, we don't know how they fit, for example. So you, it's a different type of question like that you're asking there. You're looking for connections. We're looking for how things come together. And just like you're saying, if we're in close, then it's like, okay, what are we agreeing? Are we, are we clear on this? Are we, are we all, 
Are we all committed to this? Who's going to do what, when, et cetera? So kind of making sure that the, the questions that you're asking and the role that you're playing is aligned with where you are in the meeting. I think that's why this is such an incredible model, such a wonderful model. I love this grown zone model. I think when I first learned about it, I was like so excited. Sam Keenan and Sarah Fisk, right, in their book. When I first learned about it, I was like, where has this been? <laughs> Answers I know, this, so many questions. <laughs> we just blew some minds out there. So if if you just had that reaction of where the, where has this been, I want you to comment with that because we want to know. And then the other way that to use this is to recognize that we all have a preference for one of these. If you're familiar with Myers-Briggs, this very much aligns with the J and the P. People who have a preference in judgment doesn't mean they're judgy, <laughs> but uh, tend to have a preference to want to come to close and get to execution. People who have a preference for perception want to keep things open and spontaneous, and they're really dynamite brainstormers. And then, you know, the, and of course, it's much more complicated than that psychologically. But recognize that you have a preference for being very fine, by the way. These are engineers. We love you. So just recognizing that you, everyone has a preference. And so you might have to flex. If you're a natural brainstormer and we're in close, not the time to big up, bring up the, the, the big idea that you've got and save it for another meeting or, or, or have a meeting later to discuss it. And if you have a preference for execution, stop rolling your eyeballs when we're trying to brainstorm. Just kidding. <laughs> but recognize that we'll get there. We're going to get to that execution, but we've got to go through this first. Yeah, absolutely. And just like you're saying that self-awareness point, knowing where you like to play and flexing from that is so important because you often see like you get into conversations in meetings and there'll be somebody like okay what are we going to do you know and we haven't actually sort of really pushing us really fast to get to close but we haven't even had a chance to pair ideas for, for example so they don't want to spend a whole lot of time in that open in that open space or even in the refined they just want to move to close so just recognizing like you said, what's your what's your preferred? Where do you like to play? Which part do you like to play in? And where is the group? And sort of just being with the group because we have to move through the stages to get to something that we can all agree on. I love like this you said earlier, like going back to being present. If you're checking your phone, if you if you checked out, you're missing your opportunity. You know, you're missing that opportunity to engage, and then you can't be mad. When the group <laughs> makes a decision and you didn't know what happened, because <laughs> exactly. you were present, that's on you. So accountability, y'all. <laughs> and I just want to say, Lauren, like I said in the beginning, amazing graphic recorder. You're getting to see her like in two seconds, just, you know, <laughs> sketch and draw on how powerful, right? Visuals are, we talk about, we both of us talk about this, but kind of making it visual is such an incredible and, you know, a powerful part of helping people see, helping people communicate in a different way, right? So being able to see. So, you know, in your little sketch on there, just perfect. Love it. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that. And I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of, um, of, of drawing is communication, not art. Sure, there's art, but everybody should be able to be able to quickly scribble something. <laughs> And if you, if you do want to learn how to make your stick figures better or anything like that, reach out. I have some, I have some, some resources for you. Absolutely. So that brings me to a question. Lauren, tell me what's next for you. What are you working on? Yeah. So we're going to continue to do the podcast. This meeting sucks anywhere you get your podcast that is become a resource that continues to build momentum. So we're going to keep up with our podcast this year. If you're listening to this in 2023, we launched our inaugural meeting makers Academy. We're going to continue to do that at least once a year, maybe more. So if you're listening to this before July of 2024, you can go to makemeetings.work and go to our Academy page and you can sign up for that. We're going to do it spaced one week apart, four hours per week online. So you can take it wherever you are in the world. So the podcast, the Academy, and got a bunch of resources on our, on our blog. And of course, we also have a Facebook group called, you can search meeting makers on Facebook and you can request to join that. We'd love to have you join our community and share what you're learning. And I would love to hear from you, Trisha, what is next for you? What have you got for us? Yeah, absolutely. So I think like you said, you and I both play in the same space. So 
my podcast as well. We uh, have a podcast I co-host with a colleague of mine called Every Little Model. So, so I'm so, so excited by you sharing all these models because I'm like every little model, you know, these, so we share a model every episode that, you know, models that help us thrive in the world of work. So we're working on the podcast and continuing to sort of take that out there. Models are so, so helpful in helping us to deal with ambiguous circumstances, knowing what to do, just know how to navigate something different, give us options, see something differently. Someone said to me, yesterday you know models are like a little gift wrap package of knowledge you know and it's so true it's like here's a little gift and just in this moment it might help you see something different so love models in terms of helping us okay. see something different find a new way so we're working on the podcast continue to work on the podcast so again like lauren this this meeting sucks why this meeting sucks right this meeting yep. sucks so you can yep. follow her on all your po podcast favorite platforms same thing every little model all the podcasts platforms if you enjoy it's out there and same as you I have a program that's called lead meetings at work program so this is it's a hybrid program that I run a couple times every year it's about six weeks long and we do it as a as cohorts so there's an element of some self-paced asynchronous learning and then we come together as a group to talk about what we're applying and testing out in our meetings the premise behind it is small shifts just like you've been talking about small things that we can do that have big impacts on our meeting in terms of meeting effectiveness and engagement and the environment of our meetings all that so working on that as well working on some new refinements to that and bringing in some new ideas and some additional concepts inside of that as well so that's also on the horizon and a couple other programs that I am working on in the background are not quite ready to talk about yet but they are emerging and coming up so you can watch this space and learn more about the, the professional development programs and the coaching programs and stuff like that just like Lauren so check us out on our web pages we'll share those in the links and yeah what else do you want to say Lauren be brave everybody you got this tell us what happens share your stories what about you final thought I Tell me, tell me the stories. I love to hear the stories. So definitely leave us, leave us a message, leave us a comment, tell us the story. And I want to say thank you, Lauren, for, you know, for us coming together today. Yeah, thank you. Big hug. This is awesome. Let's do this again. And Next let's do this place. again. Exactly. <laughs> Let, definitely let's do it again let's let's make it a thing you know let's let's take a question that we get asked let's make it a thing explore it together and see where it goes it's been so fun thank it's you so awesome. much thank you